Hello, my name's Lindsay Turnbull and I'm an Associate Professor in the Department of Plant Sciences at the University of Oxford. And we're right in the middle of this very serious coronavirus crisis right now. And my students are all stuck at home and we want to keep them in touch with biology and keep them in touch with us. And so we're going to make a new series of videos and they're going to be called Back Garden Biology. and welcome to this week's episode of Back Garden Biology and I just if you notice here I always sweep the leaves off the lawn but I hope you can see that the lawn is nevertheless covered in leaves just here and I know who's responsible for that it's the blackbirds because I see them here and they're tossing the leaves off the flower beds so they can see if they can find anything underneath them and of course what they're looking for is the humble earthworm and this episode is going to be dedicated to the humble earthworm because they are actually really cool creatures and they're very important in gardens. Every gardener is familiar with them uh, and I thought it'd be interesting to, to explore them a little bit more. And in the first piece what I'm going to do is think about how earthworms move and that's a way of also looking generally at the way muscles work because earthworms you move using their muscles just like any other animal does. So let's take a look at that first. So let's think about how the worm moves. Now the worm is a type of worm called an annelid worm and the key feature of annelid worms as opposed to other kinds of worms is that their bodies are divided into segments and that's really crucial for their movement. Now within the segments there are muscles. All animals move because of their muscles. So how do muscles work? Well muscles are a special type of cell and inside them there are lots of very thin fibres, microfibres if you like, and they are aligned in particular directions. So let's imagine my hands are going to represent a muscle cell and my fingers here are those fibres and they are aligned together. And what happens when the muscle cell contracts is that those little tiny fibres slide between each other. There are actually two kinds of those filaments, thick ones and thin ones, and thick ones can slide between thin ones. And that's a very active process. It uses up a lot of energy for the cell. And you can see the effect, if my thumbs represent either side of the muscle cell, is that it will shorten and contract and my thumbs move closer together. And inside a muscle, all of the cells are aligned in the same way. So they're all pulling together. So when they all contract, the muscle cell will become shorter. All right, let's see that in action. I've got a muscle in here. It's called a bicep. I'm not particularly, it's not particularly a huge muscle or anything, but if I, contract it and shorten the muscle it's attached to this bone here and so it will lift this lower part of my arm up. Now the problem with the muscle cells actually is they can't move back again so they can use up energy and they can slide together like that but then they'll actually be stuck. So how are they going to move back to their original position? Well they need something to pull them back and in this case my arm it's this muscle here it's now stretched out when this one contracted. Now it's going to contract and that contraction stretches this muscle out again. And so in our bodies, we have the muscles working in antagonistic pairs, producing the opposite movement. And that's because otherwise, every time you move, you'd be stuck there. Now, how's that gonna work with a worm's body? A worm's body isn't, doesn't consist of a series of levers like my body does. It's a thin cylinder, but as we said, divided into segments. Now let's watch a worm moving. So I captured this worm, put it in this nice clean flower pot saucer, and I filmed it as it was wandering around. And you can see it can extend its head uh, by stretching out some of those segments and making them long and thin, while other segments remain short and fat and anchor the worm to the ground, and then it pulls up the bottom half of its body as the head moves forward. So it's really essential to its movement that it can make some segments long and thin, and some segments short and fat. And how's it gonna do that? Well, here's my paper representation of a worm segment. So I'll just move those to one side. So I've got long, thin segments and I've got short, fat ones. And how can muscles achieve that? Well, let's begin by looking at what are called the circular muscles. So in every segment, there are muscles that go around the segments. And as they contract, they will squeeze down on the segment and make it into a long, thin segment. 
and it would get stuck there unless the worm has another set of muscles in the body wall and they go from top to bottom of the segment and when they contract they squeeze down on the segment and they turn it into a short fat segment. So these, these muscles, again, just like in our body, they work in antagonism. It's got the circular muscles and it's got the longitudinal muscles working in opposition to make the segments long and thin or short and fat. And then it obviously needs nerves to coordinate that movement so that some of the segments will be long and thin and others will be short and fat. And I really uh, recommend going out and finding a worm and putting it in a dish like that and watching it. It's actually quite fascinating. And you'll also see that it does have a head end with some sense organs on it. It prefers to lead with the head, but it can actually lead with the rear end if it, if it wants to and if it needs to, so it can make it go in the other direction. And you can see the tiny little bristles on the body. So when the segments become short and fat, those bristles push in to the soil and anchor it. So quite a nice thing to watch. Okay, so we've found out a little bit that about earthworms, that they're segmented, their bodies, and that they can move nicely using their coordinated muscle action. And I hope you enjoy looking at one. Now, somebody in our department really knows a lot about earthworms and other kinds of worms. And his name is Professor Peter Holland and he teaches our first years a lot about the different kinds of animal groups. And I thought it'd be interesting to ask Peter about Charles Darwin and his relationship to earthworms, because Charles Darwin wrote a whole book about earthworms. So I got hold of Peter and agreed to have a Zoom conversation with him. And I began by asking him, just why did Darwin find earthworms so fascinating? Darwin was really fascinated by earthworms. It, it's sort of odd, actually, when you look back at what Darwin wrote. He, it, the, the, the work on earthworms just seemed to be something he kept dipping back to through his life. So one of the first scientific papers he published when he came back from the Beagle voyage was on earthworms, and it was just a short note to the Geological Society. And then 40, more than 40 years later, um, he wrote his large book on earthworms, which was the last book he wrote before he died. So it came out in 1881, just six months before he died. And in fact, I think he was getting pretty fed up with earthworms by that stage, having worked on them for more than 40 years, because he even, there's a, there's a really nice letter that he wrote to someone saying that he's, he really wants to finish this book on earthworms before joining them. So <laughs> I thought that was quite nice. But anyway, so why, why did they fascinate him so much? Well, I, I think actually it's, it's because he was, Darwin was fascinated by change, cha change on the planet. And of course we think about that in terms of natural selection and evolution and, and quite long-term periods of change. But he was really interested in anything which was changing um, on the planet, um, erosion as well, geologic processes. And when we think about earthworms, what he was able to show and what he had learned really was that earthworms are changing the planet over quite short time periods by moving soil, burying things. And he was really impressed by how he could see even buildings disappear, old buildings being covered by soil, which he put down to earthworms. So I think he was fascinated because they were agents of change. Oh, that's really cool. I'd never thought of it like that at all. Um, <laughs> so how did he manage to fill an entire book about earthworms? Well, let's not forget he'd been looking at them for 40 years. So he had he had 40 years of his own meticulous observations on them and lots of experiments he did on them. And so he wrote about their behavior, like how worms move in burrows. He wrote about their ecology, what they feed on and how they pass soil through their guts. Um, and he wrote loads in the book about effects on humans. I mentioned buildings, but um, he, he wrote about how soils were, turnover of the soil was so important for farming and for plant growth because um, it, it created aeration of the soil and, and helped drainage and it moved nutrients around. So he wrote a lot about that. Um, so he had all that material that he had gathered and not just by his own research, but also writing to people in, in correspondence and um, reading all the literature beforehand that had come about worms and some of his experiments were, were really quite fascinating actually he you know there, there was he, he describes them in the book how he'd bring worms into the house and then he'd play the piano to them or someone in the family would play the piano and see if they would respond and then he they had a, a bassoon he'd play the bassoon at them and see if they'd respond to d different notes 
um, he shine, shining a candle near them to see if they responded to light. Or even there's one, one passage where he takes a, a red hot poker and he doesn't touch the worm with it, but he brings it near the worm to see if it can feel the heat nearby. Um, so it's all those sorts of experiments that he did. So he really did have a, have a lot of information to pack, his, pack into his book. God, I feel sorry for those worms, actually. It sounds like a bit like a sort of worm nightmare thing going into Darwin's house. So what do you think his most fascinating discovery was? Or perhaps what was his most uh, important discovery about worms? Well, I, th I think his discoveries about their sense organs were quite important because people hadn't thought about that very much before. So, you know, those experiments I just mentioned showed that earthworms can detect vibrations but they weren't able to detect airborne sounds for instance um, so those were interesting but probably the most important were were his discoveries on how much soil passed through the guts of earthworms and what that effect that had on the whole structure of the soil I and mean, of course he wasn't the first person to point out that soil was being moved around by earthworms and Gilbert White did, wrote about that in the 1700s but Darwin was actually quite quantitative. So he tried to calculate with experiments and observations how much soil was moving. So for instance, he, even in his garden, he built something which he called his worm stone, which was a great big um, round stone, like a millstone really, a little bit smaller with a hole in the middle. And this was a flat stone he put on the ground and he wanted to measure how long it would take for it to, be, to sink into the earth because earthworms were um, sort of mo eating soil and then passing it up into worm casts onto the ground. So to measure it, he inserted a sort of measuring rod down the centre, which went down further into the ground so it didn't move. And then you could sort of measure as the worm stone dropped. And he, 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 he thought that the earth was probably being turned over um, at the rate of about five centimetres per, per year or of that um, at a maximum, it may have been a bit less, may have been sort of one centimetre a year, but it would have varied in different places anyway. But I think the important thing is he realised just how massively important that is for plant growth, moving nutrients around, aerating the soil, making channels and actually moving everything around. Um, um, so, yeah, I think those were the most fascinating discoveries. Great. So what didn't he know? What do we know now about worms that would have, that would Darwin, if we could bring him back now and tell him these things, that obviously I'm sure he'd be delighted to find out what we know about earthworms now that he didn't know. Anything special that you would point to? Yeah, I think a couple of things. One is diversity of different earthworm species. So we, we have 27 species of earthworms in the UK, and there's probably more than a thousand, maybe 5,000 species around the world. And their, their ecologies are and their behaviours are a little bit different from each other. And he didn't really write very much about that in the book. He sort of grouped them all together. But of course, we now know that some will make vertical burrows, which they'll pull leaves down into. Others, which the ones that he was most fascinated in, are the ones making horizontal burrows and eating soil. And others just live in leaf litter. So it's quite a lot of ecological diversity. And I don't think he realised that. But also, the, some of the more recent works, it shows... The earthworms are quite tolerant of heavy metals in the in the soil. Things like cadmium, copper, gold, um, are concentrations that will kill a lot of other um, invertebrates. Earthworms seem to be able to tolerate them, and we know that they've got particular proteins, metallothionines, um, which can bind and sequester those metals to stop them having a harmful effect on the animal. So they they do have these really interesting biochemical adaptations to toxic chemicals in the soil. So I think, yeah, Darwin would have found that fascinating, I'm sure, because there's a bit of natural selection must have led to that. Okay, so Peter's obviously a fan and he can explain there why Darwin was so fascinated with worms and what he knew about them and what he'd probably like to know about them. And one of the other things that I find really fascinating about worms is there's actually a massive abundance of them in this garden. Every time I dig, I find them. So they're really, really important for lots of other organisms that live in the garden, like the blackbirds. And you can watch the blackbirds running over the lawn and you can see them, they put their head to one side and they're listening for worms and other things that are moving uh, under the soil so they can rush in and grab them. Uh, and foxes, for example, often come through gardens. They can actually eat quite a lot of earthworms. 
And so can badgers, of course. Badgers eat enormous quantities of earthworms. I don't have badgers in my garden, but one of my students has been finding them in his garden and put out a camera trap uh, to send me that footage. Thanks very much, Henry. So I'm going to include it here. Very good timing there. Uh, and in America as well, there are lots of different types of earthworm. And there's a, a guy there studying them. And he had noticed, or he found out, that some people in the States, they, they put a big iron stake into the soil, and then they run a sort of file over the top of it to create these deep vibrations. And when they do that, all these worms come up to the surface, and they collect them, and they sell them for fishing bait. And you can actually make a living like that, amazingly. But he wanted to know, what was the adaptive value of that? Why would earthworms come pouring out of the soil when you play this tune to them? And his hypothesis was that this was actually something to do with an anti-predator behaviour. And he knows that moles, right, moles are massive hunters of earthworms. They're not just foxes, not just badgers, but moles pretty much only eat worms. And that perhaps this vibration was, the, was mimicking the sound of a mole coming through a tunnel and digging. And the best escape for the worms, if they hear a mole coming, is to get above ground. Moles never come above ground. And so he did this amazing cool experiment, and I've got a little video of it here to show you, where he had a box, he filled it with worms, and you can see on the surface there's no worms at all, and then he introduces a mole. And sure enough, all the worms come pouring out uh, as they hear the mole approaching. And, uh, and that's a really nice paper that's published in a, a, what's called an open access journal, where anybody's allowed to go and access that paper and use the footage. So thank you very much to him for doing that great piece of work. OK, well, that's it for Back Garden Biology this week. I hope you can enjoy finding some worms in your garden. If it goes very cold, of course, you won't find them so easily. They're not very active. If it goes cold, and they go down deeper into the soil. But if you get your trowel out, I'm sure you can find one or move a plant pot or two. And certainly as the weather gets warmer, they'll start getting a lot more active. So take care, stay safe. There's better news for the pandemic, of course. And let's hope we can all be back outside soon.